quick re recap of the main points of the precepts discussion and uh, because you may have had questions then and uh, as I recap, you know, you may get some idea of, uh, you may get some memory back of that uh, question. So, so in the first instance is this idea of precepts as being some sort of a boundary or limitation. Uh, how many of you were there for the precepts uh, meeting? Dominic, are you also there? Okay. So, sorry? Which meeting? Uh, you were not there that time. Okay. So, uh, so, okay. Maybe we can. So, in in the first section, the whole thing was that these precepts are not like a battle with ourselves or a battle with society where you want to do something and you are inclined to do something, you have desires and so others, religious leaders, society, government, state are imposing limitations on you shall not do this, you shall not do this and so on. Uh, and because this view puts you in opposition with the rest of the world. And the Buddhist view is that they cannot be, we are all interconnected and they cannot be opposition like this at a basic level between us and the rest of the world and that he calls the love mode and as opposed to the power mode where you are trying to either have your own way uh, by subjugating others or have your own way by hiding things from others and doing whatever you want in a devious manner. So the first thing was that the precepts are more like an ethics of intention. It's not just a vow or an order or a commandment to do something or not to do something. So it's more, as they say, uh, ethics of intention, an ethics of aspiration, and an ethics of training. Training your mind to do things which are in tune and in line with going for refuge. So if you are saying, I go for refuge to the Buddha and the Dharma, then you are committing, uh, you are committing yourself, you are taking a vow, to lead your life according to the Dharma. Now, when we say your life, uh, a human being is a normal human being, not the Buddha, because there we say he realizes the Dharma, the body in which he realizes the Dharma is called the Dharma body and so on. But if you just look at an ordinary human, it's name and form, Nama Rupa. So it's name and form. Then you can have body, speech and mind. So, going for refuge is not some abstract entity going for refuge. It is the body, speech and mind of the person going for refuge. So, therefore, the precepts and the, the precepts and your way of living are an extension of that going for refuge. And therefore, that extension of going for refuge has to be also an extension of body, speech and mind. Which is why you have precepts that deal with actions of the body negative or positive, actions of the um, uh, of speech that are negative or positive, an action of mind that is negative or positive. So, uh, that is the main aspect. Now, again, as we said, I think at that point, that these are principles, these are not rules, but from these principles one can derive rules for oneself or for society. And Again, you know, this is an antidote, this approach of living is an antidote to our common popular understanding. Uh, A, that uh, you do things for others because they may do things for you. So it's an unconditional sort of approach. And also that, you know, it's not a cynical approach. Today, many people say, Are, there is nothing, what ethics? Everything is done just for self-interest and vested interest. Person does, his only motivation is to benefit himself. Now that is not the cynical view that Buddhism takes. And again there is the sort of uh, golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But some scholars say that this can become very oppressive because then uh, 
you have a tendency and we see that the state has a tendency to become a nanny state and to tell others to do what you uh, you would like others to tell so don't eat beef and i will be very happy if somebody tells me don't eat beef because i believe you should not eat beef so uh, the reverse of that may make more sense in buddhism do not do into others what you would not like others do unto you do not kill others because you may not like others killing you whatever positive you may do and you may want others to do to you at least don't do harm to others which you don't want so in other in some other uh, uh, thinker has put it this way do to those who are downstream what you would like those who are upstream to do to you because we are not actually all at the equal level i will not do to you what you will not if you are too equal we can talk like but there is also a hierarchy in society and we recognize that so some people are upstream some people are midstream and some people are downstream and if we are in the mid middle let us not do for those who are downstream do to others who are downstream what we would not like those who are upstream to us to do to us you wouldn't like to be kicked out of your job by a unscrupulous employer so let us not kick out of jobs those who are our employees who are more unfortunate than us and so on and then you can have the whole uh, structural ideology there so so that's another aspect of precepts um and then we also discussed this thing about when you go for refuge you are making a commitment to follow the buddha's teachings so when we talk of in terms of mandala the structure the sort of representation of our life and its environment we put the buddha at the center of our mandala and those things which are close to him closer in to the center and those things which are superfluous extra unnecessary at the margins of the mandala so at any point if someone says you know i am a buddhist he can self reflect and say how where is the buddha in my life is he at the center is he somewhere in the middle somewhere on the margins and that's the meaning of putting the buddha at the center of the mandala then we had looked at some of the canonical sources some of the scriptural sources for these precepts where they come from were they invented by later monks or the buddha himself responsible for giving these precepts so uh, the precept normally as it is in pali and as it is uh, even in this 10 precepts even in this western buddhist order from the negative point of view, i shall refrain from sexual misconduct so but the positive one is that i will lead my life with contentment doesn't specifically say i will only have good sexual relations or i will have uh, whatever you know holistic uh, opposite of sexual mis- no it says live with contentment and uh, now i am not don't take this as my personal view point do i see a lot of sense and strength in this argument of sangha rakshita he says that we know in buddhism we talk about the three worlds now within so the world in which we are world in the sense of not even the realm within the world but uh, world in its most general sort of sense you know in a cosmic sense this is the world of desire so the three worlds in uh, buddhism are the world of desire the world of form and the world of formlessness hmm? now let me use his own words also because these three layers are the planes or worlds or spheres of sensuous desire kama of archetypal form rupa and of no archetypal form arupa now within this plane of kama this the world of desire you have those six realms hell hungry ghosts animals human asuras gods so within the world of desire you have these six realms and 
the world of form has 16 subplanes so to say 16 divisions hierarchical and the lower ones are known as the lower heavens and the higher ones are known as the higher heavens and the third one which is the formless formless uh, world has four subplanes now what he is saying is that this tension sexual tension between male and female is only a characteristic of the world of desire so it's when you are in hell animal human asura god that there is this tension between the sexes because in the world of the higher planes on the planes of archetypal form there is no such thing as sexual dimorphism that is no separation into male and female the inhabitants of these planes all being what we would call from the human point of view androgynous it, this sexual division is found only in these play our plane moreover since a state of sexual dimorphism is a state of polarization, tension and projection. It is also a state of discontent because you're always trying to complete that separation. If you're male, you're trying to mate with a woman. If you're a woman, you're trying to mate. Now, of course, I, let's not get into the same sex uh, issue. But there again, when we come to the same sex, then also, you know, this is actually a man in a woman's body and all that sort of thing. But uh, sticking to the uh, uh, this thing, he said it's a state of discontent. The state of spiritual androgyny, on the contrary, is a state of harmony, relaxation and content. So observance of the third precept, that means avoiding sexual misconduct, does not consist simply in abstention from the various well-known forms of sexual misconduct, but also and more importantly, in the experience of contentment, the vertical the higher forms as distinct from the horizontal part of such abstention. So you are striving to transcend, you are trying, trying to transcend the world of desire rather than just abstaining from misconduct within the world of desire on a horizontal level. Now he says, he now comes to the point where he says, okay, now we used to discuss, he says, and we also discussed, are these realms in our world of desire, real physical realms or are they psychological states of mind? Okay. So when it comes to form and formlessness, the other two worlds, the higher worlds, he says, are they real realms, real worlds, or are they psychological states? And if they are psychological states, when do you experience them? And he says that you experience them when you do meditation. So whereas the six realms within the world of desire, you are constantly transversing them even as a psychological state without any extra effort, without sitting down on a cushion or anything. You will go from hell to animality, you will behave like an animal, you will behave like a human, you will behave in a divine way and so on. But those higher worlds you will access only through meditation. And now this has been established in the sense, this part, what he's saying, that there is this sort of world of form and world of formlessness. He says, is when you do Shamatha meditation. Now, you remember when the Buddha went out, went forth and became a sannyasi. He first went to all the existing great teachers of his time. And they taught him everything there was to teach about meditation. And he reached with their teaching and his practice, the highest level, you know, the 16 subplanes of the world of form and the four subplanes are the highest of that in the world of formlessness through Samatha meditation. That is calm abiding meditation, concentration. And then he told his teachers, this is not what I am seeking. Because in that state, in those higher form and formless world, is a state of bliss, total contentment. The higher, the heavens are in those formless worlds. 
Pushita heaven and the highest heaven where gods live for hundreds of thousands of years. So Buddha said, this is not, although the teacher said, you have achieved even more than what we have achieved. So you should take over our Sangha and we will live under you. But Buddha said, no, this is not, I am looking for enlightenment. I am not looking for bliss and contentment. And I am looking for a solution for suffering. This is an escape from suffering. You just go higher and higher in your own mental psychological state till you are in this state of bliss. Which you may mistake if you, that this is my union with God. That state of bliss. Now, so the Buddha said, after you have trained your mind with Kashamatha meditation, you arrive at a crossroads. You can either continue with this type of meditation to do, go higher and higher to the form and formless world, or you take the path of Vipassana, where you use this trained mind to get insight into the nature of ultimate reality. And from there you will find what he later discovered in enlightenment, the answer to the problem of suffering. So here is the Buddha's own experience and then many meditators after that, including Sangha Rakshita, experience some of these higher worlds through meditation. So, so what he is saying is that the sort of uh, injunction against sexual misconduct should not be misunderstood simply as forcing yourself to do something or not do something, but to understand that your ultimate spiritual nature is not sexual. That is to say, in those higher realms actually, there, are, there is no this sort of tension, the question of conduct and misconduct will not arise. So this is one more interesting thing in his book. As I said, I cannot say that, I mean 100% I accept what he is saying, but it does make some sense and some logic, especially when you compare it to the meditation about or the form Rupa meditation and Arupa meditation. I have another question about this issue of sexual misconduct, you know, yes. especially like these days, I mean, I'm talking more like a global way, like, you know, marriage is looked as in some ways like a defunct institution. Many people choose not to get married, they choose to have uh, open relationships. And now, in one way, we, I mean, it depends on your point of view. You may call this sexual misconduct, oh, how can you have a sex if you're not married to someone? especially in Indian, many Indian sort of, you know, view in the mindset. But then if you live abroad, for example, in many like Nordic countries, marriage is defunct. Most people have children out of marriage or without getting married. So it's like how, I mean, this is just one aspect. Or, and then there are also this idea of open relationship, multiple partners. So then how do you think, I mean, what would your, be your, or in some ways, Buddhism's view on, on these kinds of, Di like diverse sexual romantic relationships? Um, I can tell you, uh, I, I'm not sure about the Buddhist view, I can tell you my views. But uh, <laughs> no, so once you know. Yeah, 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 she knows my, she knows all my views. No, uh, and they are not that radical anymore, as you said. The whole world is taking those views up. No, you see, once we were with, in a teaching with Rinpoche, and uh, there were some very high level lamas sitting there and of course Jetsunma was there. Jetsunma is this British lady who was the first Tibetan Buddhist nun. She was also there because they come to listen to Rinpoche since it's just about once a year. And the thing was about emptiness and duality, non-duality. And it was getting damn serious, you know, man. It was like hanging like a dark cloud over. And I could see and I wanted to break up that somber mood, you know. And some of the discussion went to precepts. I don't know if I've told you this story before. So I put up my hand to ask the question and there this mic going around. So I said that, you know, uh, my question is related to the precepts. Are they written in stone? Or are they also changing according to social norms and ethos and all that? And I said, I give an example, I said, for instance, homosexuality. In the Venera, it's clearly a misconduct. Now you may say, oh, maybe it's a misconduct because monks are not supposed to indulge in sexual, mis sexual uh, uh, relationships. And if all the monks in the monastery, like in an army, all men only, 
then you know it it may end up with some homosexual acts but today to look down upon somebody who is gay is itself politically incorrect so now what is it still a misconduct or not i gave that example and i said going further if somebody wants to transcend duality wants to transcend duality and wants to have a threesome <laughs> is that a sexual misconduct <laughs> so of course the whole audience cracked up and rinpoche very smartly says i think i will ask jatsunma to answer this question <laughs> is okay to have threesome or not so she said uh, she took it seriously and she said see some precepts are written in stone you cannot say that killing a human being is justified because now society has accepted human killing or human sacrifice or anything like that so there are some things she said if you use your common sense they are not they are written in stone you know and then she said there are other things like now the example you gave she says homosexuality sexual freedom and libertarianism sort of in sexual matters that she says we have to reflect further and see it's not just what it may do to us but what it does to the whole of society is it overall beneficial in the long run it's not just like this one act and this one one sort of relationship so she said but one certain other things are also written in stone it should be in such a way any sort of thing that you are experimenting with you should not be hurting anybody there should be no deceit there should be no you know uh, exploitation so all those things still hold otherwise some you may say she said are not written in stone this was her reply 